Welcome to our discussion with the local candidates for the House of Delegates. We're joined by Republican David Yancey from the 94th District in New Purdue. Welcome. Thank you, Les. Uh, the 2017 race was nothing short of wild. Your name was picked not out of a hat, but out of a bowl, mm -hmm. as, I, as I recall correctly. That is correct. That is correctly. correct. So this is a, a rematch against uh, Shelley Simons. You have some new voters in the district. The lines have been redrawn. So just tell folks about your background. Sure. I grew up in Newport News. I'm from Newport News. And after I graduated, I came home to work and help start our family business before I did some other things. And then a few years ago, started my own business while working in our family business. So I spent almost all my life in the city of Newport News. And I'm really proud to be able to represent Newport News. I know it's challenges, but I also know what we have to offer. And I think we're doing great things in Newport News that position the peninsula and really all of Hampton Roads to be able to continue to, to work on a lot of the things I've done at Richmond, whether it's the 64 winding on the, the Hampton Roads bridge tunnel, we have low unemployment, the shipyard has 5,000 new jobs this year with, with what we've been able to do to support them. There's more to do and, and I think some of the things that we're collaborating, whether it's Hampton University, Christopher Newport University, uh, and some of the, the, the schools as well with workforce development to be able to foster and grow new opportunities in our community. And that's really the thing that I'm running on is the opportunities that the people that I represent want and need and what we're doing to deliver those results. Well, let's talk about those. As you go around the district, what are the issues people are talking about most? Certainly health care. That's one of the big issues. Education, of course. Uh, so we're working on and, and, and some of the concerns people have about just the future of the city and where we're going and how we're going to get there. In their minds, they don't look at it as, well, you're in the legislature and this is something for council. They're looking at it as, we're part of something special. How are we going to get where we're going? And, and so when I'm knocking on doors and I'm talking with people, sharing with them what my vision is for the next steps that we can take to continue to grow our community. What is your uh, vision for health care, for example? You, your opponent has been critical of you and sure. your votes in the past, but what do you look at going forward? So looking forward, we helped to pass Medicaid responsibly in Virginia. And I think it's really important that we put this in perspective. The, the budget that was proposed in 2014 said that the director of planning and budget would be able to allocate monies out of the different state agencies to be able to pay for Medicaid. There was nothing set there for safeguards or anything like that. So working with this governor, Governor Northam, we were able to put in provisions to make certain that Virginia can, excuse me, can find a path forward to be able to pay for health care. We've got that resolved. Now we need to work with the insurance. We'd get bring in more insurance companies into the state of Virginia to create more competition to bring the cost of health care down. So we can look at reinsurance programs. We can look at other things so that these costs can go down and also guarantee that we can continue to have access to good quality health care. Let's talk about a couple of other issues, particularly in the wake of the mass shooting in Virginia Beach. Gun violence is a big issue. Absolutely. In Virginia. Uh, do you favor legislation. Obviously, the State Crime Commission is looking at this. The governor's proposed a package of bills. Individual members have their own ideas. Mm -hmm. What makes sense to you? Universal background checks, the red flag uh, idea? So, Les, for your, for your viewers, there's one bill that I put in immediately was a bill that was called Rule 35. And what Rule 35 is, it's a federal law that gives prosecutorial discretion to be able to work with a person who's already been convicted of a crime in the federal system that wants to go back to the prosecutors and say, I know where, say, the guns are, or I know where the drugs are. And these can be street gangs, it can be motorcycle gangs. This is something that Virginia can change its law to match federal law and immediately be able to use those same prosecutorial powers where our Commonwealth attorneys can now begin these investigations to find these illegally trafficked guns and to be able to pull them off the streets. And you had mentioned also the red flag law. Working with Delegate Miara as a, I'm, co-sponsoring his red flag law. But I think the important thing here is Delegate Miaris has looked at it from the perspective to make certain that people's Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment right to due process is respected. We're talking about law-abiding citizens. We should explain what the law is. It allows sure. a family member to go to a, the police or a court and say, I have somebody who's troubled and maybe their gun should be taken away temporarily. Correct. It's making a person who could be dangerous to themselves or to others. But he also has a provision in there that if a person files a false claim, then that person could be looking at a felony charge. So there's a check and a balance to make sure that a person's rights are not infringed upon deliberately by maybe a person who has um, some reason to file that, you know, for harmful reasons or whatever. Point here is though, we're looking at ways that we can help our citizens be safer and make certain that we can get these guns off the streets. A lot of the young people that I coach, I coach high school rugby, they share with me what goes on in their community. We're talking about young people that live in Stewart Gardens downtown or Marshall Courts downtown or even up in the, you know, in the northern part of the city where some of these acts of violence are going on. 
they speak to me, we, we, we drive around, they point out some of the things that I need to know. So taking their knowledge and in speaking with the local Newport News Police Department that's saying in fact what these young people are sharing with them is in fact accurate, taking that perspective to Richmond and getting these guns, these illegally trafficked guns, off our streets. You uh, mentioned education earlier. There are a number of schools in Newport News, I think it's 14, that are not fully accredited or accredited with conditions, which mm -hmm. means they have to propose a plan to the state to get fully accredited. What can be done? What's your idea to improve those schools? So we're working on with, I've been working with their local school boards to be able to find access and quality opportunities for people that can get into the schools and teach our children and give them an excellent education. But I think there also the issue is a lot of people say, well, we need more money for schools. And I don't disagree. And we've been working very difficult. But where would that come from? So in the state side, it comes from the budget. And so the budget, as you may recall, we've, we've, we came out of a really tough recession mm -hmm. that really hit Virginia hard, and it took a long time to recover. As a balanced budget in the state, we get the money that we have to be able to spend towards education. So my thoughts are we get that as money we can and find additional monies to help support things like workforce development. But in doing that and getting that money into the schools, also want to be able to say we have to have results. It matters to have the results because if you have a child whose test scores are failing, then it's going to be difficult for them once they graduate. And the other side of it is, of course, making certain that we have adequate teacher pay raises so that we can continue to get teacher pay raises to the national average and give our teachers the support they need so that they can give our children an excellent education. But without raising taxes, where does that come from? The rainy day fund? The rainy day fund is set aside just that in case, in case we run into another recession. What Virginia has been able to do is we've seen an uptick in activity in our economic opportunities and therefore there's some taxes that get paid, whether it's income taxes or say uh, capital gains taxes if people are selling an asset. But if the economy is improving, which it is, and if we're attracting employers, which we are, and businesses to the Commonwealth, and we're also sustaining what we have, then there's more economic activity. More economic activity obviously translates into more monies that come into the general fund, and that's more money that we can invest in education. All right, let's talk about a couple of health care issues. Uh, the opioid crisis mm -hmm. is obviously just that, a crisis. A number of states, including Virginia, have sued Big Pharma. Right. Uh, several doctors, but not a lot, have also been prosecuted. What more needs to be done to combat the opioid crisis? I think what we're looking at in Virginia and what we have been able to achieve is addressing some of these issues, going after these, uh, these opioids. And then the key thing here is, is really just cracking down on the, the prosecution for people that are just flippantly giving out prescriptions in, in high amounts. So what we've been working on in the legislature, the people that are medical professionals that understand this world, what can we do to reduce the people that are on these medicines, what can we do to help the people that are addicted to these medicines, and then of course what can we ultimately do to make certain that those are opportunities for people. One of the biggest challenges that we have in Virginia is in southwest Virginia with the need to grow our economy. And I think some of the frustration that people have out there is they're just living this very frustrating life. And in talking with the members from the southwest delegation or from people who represent communities where there's a lot of challenge, give people hope for an opportunity to do something with their lives so that they get away from, from this frustration and, and be able to go out and achieve great things. But how do you reach those people? Is it uh, more counseling that's available in schools, for example, or is it community service boards? How do you reach people at the local level? I think it's all of the above. So you had mentioned two. So in this past General Assembly session, we worked with the schools to be able to get more counselors into the schools. So if a child is having difficulties, there's a counselor there to work with. And to the community service boards, one of the things that helps with that Medicaid expansion that we've passed that I talked about earlier is to be able to get the resources to the local community service boards so they can work with these individuals that are having difficult frustrations and, and whether it's mental illness or it's chemical addiction to be able to have the resources that these people will need to help them have a, a better lifestyle. Let me uh, raise one other issue that's been in the news a lot lately and that's vaping which particularly affects young people and as you well know there are vape shops everywhere. Most mm -hmm. of the big drugstore chains have stopped selling them e-cigarettes, but vape shops are everywhere. Is there something that can be done at the state level to better regulate it or better educate people? I think when you look at what's going on, there's certainly going to be an issue for the upcoming General Assembly session. This past year, working with Altria, we raised the uh, age limit to purchase tobacco up to 21, in large part because what we were hearing from Altria... Which is a big tobacco company. Correct. Was that people say 18 and younger who are buying these cigarettes were then selling them into the lower schools, the middle schools. So I think this is something we're going to have to go back, we're going to have to look at as well and, and consider what can we do to be able to, to address this very important issue. What would change if the Democrats gained control of the House? I think, it's, I think it, you would look at probably a different perspective on the way the state of Virginia 
would be governed. Certainly some of the things that we really take for credit and for, and for advantage to growing the state of Virginia's economy certainly could be addressed. I think one thing that you're looking at certainly is potential for, for higher income taxes. I think you'll definitely see some stringence upon regulatory environment on businesses. But I think one thing that people really need to understand is, is we talk about the right to work laws in the state of Virginia. And people say, well, you know, I, th I think I understand, but I'm not really sure. But you've got to understand what Virginia is competing against is not just, say, a foreign country for opportunities in manufacturing. It's also our other states, states like South Carolina and Georgia, for an example that have a very aggressive way that they compete and compete against Virginia. So we need to keep Virginia a very pro-business environment so that we can continue to grow our economy and be able to weather any future recessions. A lot of people have been saying, since you and I grew up on the peninsula together, that we need to get away from the military. It's not that we, we want to get rid of it, it's just that we need to diversify our local economy. And I think if we get rid of laws like this, the, the right to work laws in Virginia, it's going to make it a challenge because then you're going to have businesses that are going to say, well, gosh, if Virginia is getting rid of all these things and you have taxes and you have regulations and it's more difficult and you have a lack of consistency, predictability and stability, then maybe we should look somewhere else. And that's when you see businesses up and moving and you're seeing it in the northern states like Connecticut, excuse me, like Connecticut, for example. So if we're if we don't want to go down that road, then we need to learn from history and we need to learn what those states that have made those errors have done and we need to keep some of the laws intact. As we wrap things up, let me give you a chance to make your closing arguments. The third time around against uh, Shelley Simons, why are you the better candidate? You know, I appreciate the question, and I certainly understand there's a lot of excitement about the rematch. But in my mind, it's not about a rematch. It's about two visions of the direction that Newport News, Hampton Roads, and the Commonwealth of Virginia are going. For me, I look at and what I share with people are the results that we've delivered that mattered. When I was elected in 2011, people said, you'll never get 64 on the peninsula widened. We'll never have a brand new Hampton Roads bridge tunnel. I worked with Republicans and Democrats in both chambers. And now, if you live on the peninsula, you have three lanes of 64 going up to Lightfoot. That project will be done by 2021, and we're looking to expand up to Richmond. We are going to have a brand new Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel in just the next few years. I mean, think about that for a moment. Nobody ever thought we'd ever even have that. And to complement that, we're also going to deepen the Port of Virginia so that we can handle all these massive Panamax ships, which will grow our economy and the maritime community. These are some of the important things that we work to do that people said, well, you know, we'll never do. When I got elected, it was in 2011, which is really at the height of that severe recession that our country was facing and our community was facing. If I remember correctly, I think the, the peninsula had roughly 7.1% unemployment rate. Now we've cut that in half. 5,000 new jobs just this year at the Newport News shipyard. Enough work for a generation to build two aircraft carriers and two submarines at the same time with a new foundry to guarantee that these ships can be built on time. So transportation, on education, we've led the fight on human trafficking and we've really cut into things like that. So for safety and of course, as I just said a moment ago on education, we've led the fight on workforce development to deliver the results to make certain that we can build those ships or that we have a well-trained workforce in our community. So the, the things that I'm working on are continuing to keep Virginia as the number one state to do business in and for me to continue to have Newport News as that beacon of light for opportunity so that we can have great access to great opportunities for all the people I represent. All right, David Yancey, the Republican candidate in the 94th District in New Produce, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you for watching.